Are you ready to see another unique castle and settlement built by your fellow Going Medieval player? Well, you are in the right place. My name is Peter and besides Broadmead Commune by Mo Eddy, I will give you a sneak peek of what other players have been working on. Some of the usernames you will recognize from previous showcase episodes like X1 Fighter, Soyuz, Sir Handeman and Exergy and they are back with new projects. Their full builds will be featured in the next episodes along with many others. If you have a settlement you would like to share with the world in my showcase series, send me the save file to the email in the description and I will gladly show it off. In the meantime, take a look at all the previous showcases using the link up there on the right or down below. Now, what has Moedi built here? It is a medium-sized, single castle settlement made from a mix of materials with limestone being the most common. The commune is spread across quite a number of levels, both below and above ground. And from the history screen, we can see there are 11 settlers living and working here in the peace and quiet thanks to the peaceful gameplay mode. So no raids in the 300 or so days since the start, that being 20 hours of playtime. The difficulty is normal and the map type is hillside, see it visible if you want to play on this particular map yourself. The primary and secondary entrances to Broadmead Commune are on the long edge of the settlement's limestone block walls. The main entrances feature double merchant stalls, which is a more guarded approach as trade happens outside, away from the main item storage. Someone is distrustful of their neighbors, huh? Any chickens gone missing lately? <laughs> I do like the detail of an extra little arch before the gates and wall decorations above it. I have to admit, I would have personally gone for a more open approach to entrances and trade in the peaceful mode. The other main entrance is much the same, but next to it is a mother of all stockpiles with everything right there for the taking. No roof cover, interestingly enough, but the wooden floors will prevent the worst of the decomposition which comes from the ground type. Those steel bars are shining so beautifully in the sun and as far as I can see, this is all building and crafting materials with some packed up furniture or workbenches. Between the two entrances there seems to be a small chapel of sorts and the outside looks very regular, but the inside is anything but. There is a deep hole in it and if we take the direct path down we find ourselves in what looks like a full on crypt slash church many levels below the ground. There are tables, chairs, lots of candles, shrines and on each side extra rooms are set up as crypts. Not a lot of caskets mind you with the center one being locked behind an extra door. This place might not be the best from a gameplay and efficiency perspective but the visuals make up for that in spades. If we keep to the path and simulate a settler walking through the tunnels and up the stairs, soon we go outside and into a central courtyard. This place has many paths going down, but we are looking for the one which leads to the other such crypt slash temple room. The size and design of it is identical. If I change the camera angle, you can see that they are mirror images of each other. Moving up a few layers, the rest of the underground rooms become visible, which we will look into a bit later. This design of outside chapels with deep holes connected to crypts far below is something I have never ever had the pleasure of showing you before. Best marks for original design to Mo Eddy. Now let us walk through the side secondary entrance and see what is behind the gates. This is an open ground floor of a building with furnaces and a staircase leading up opposite to those. And just to compare, let's look at the other side. Staircase, check, but kilns on this side. And what's this? Oh, that is the inner garden and a pet hub we saw before. I must admit, I love using the camera like this and traveling like the settlers do because it gives us a whole new perspective. These appear to be small sectioned off farms, but here is one of my favorite features. Red current bushes on top of walls like hanging gardens and only accessible by upper level pathways. There are a lot more of them here and another door I simply must check out. Aha, the kitchens and the food storage. I love the usage of a middle path made from clay blocks for the highest movement bonus and thus allowing control over which path settlers use. 
This is something I explained in my road guide, link up here and below, so I won't go into more details here. The shape of the iced food basement is simple and heavily reinforced with wooden beams as well as pillars left unmined to provide extra support. There are two such rooms here, the only difference is the content, one for raw and the other for processed foods. The lack of proper meals might point to a herb shortage. Hmm, let's hope Moedi will shed some light on that in the comments. Now if you are wondering why the honey and wax production is outside and not incorporated into the settlement, the answer is simple. It wasn't in the game back when the settlement was first designed, so it ended up outside. This is a good example of why you should try to plan ahead especially with early access games like Going Medieval, to build bigger and with room to spare. There is a serious overproduction happening here, but I think the problem is simply lack of storage targets for honey and wax, so it's just produced and dropped on the floor. It's interesting to see that this player added a few more food and even ice producing objects here along with an apothecary workbench. He went with the flow and made a good thing out of an unexpected lack of room after the content update. But where did those staircases in the kitchen lead to is what I want to find out. Ominous music please. Aha! The starting setting of every Elder Scrolls game. Dungeons. Weapon racks for guards, check. Tiny cells, check. Hay bed, check. Bones and skeletons, check. Oh, nope. Ah, oh, that's too bad. 8 out of 10 for effort. Let's go back and see what else is on this level. Wait, what? Pyres? Indoor? And underground? What in the world? From a gameplay perspective, it's fine. But from a role-playing perspective, it's a red flag. These two are just passages to the crypts so we will move on to what looks like sleeping rooms. 2x3, one of the more efficient designs, just enough room for a bed and a brazier. 4x1 design is even more efficient, but might be problematic once settlers stop moving through the beds to fuel braziers. The doors are closed, but I would advise keeping them open so settlers can move in and out faster. Not too much detail, not too little in this section. Overall nice and neat. We should take a look at the upper levels of the settlement next. But before that, I want to show you some totally new settlements other players are building right now. Player who goes by Exergy, who you might remember by that star fort from episode 4, and the insanely detailed castle and settlement in episode 5, is at it again, with this monster build. I am not sure if he is going for a Minas Tirith replica or something equally grand, but what I am sure is that he will blow our minds again when it's finished. X1 Fighter from episode 7, whose settlement Tor keeps attacking with lightning, is also building something new and tall. Not much info or screenshots for now, but I will try to find some for future episodes. Varna is a new player's nickname in this series, but here is what that player is building. And it looks magical. I cannot wait to get my hands on that save file. Varna, if you are watching this, don't be a stranger and share your beautiful build with us. My email is in the description. There is a number of other screenshots I will show you a bit later during the video and if you have been enjoying this one so far, please don't mind me asking you to hit that like button, comment what is your most desired feature for going medieval and subscribe to see more of my videos in the future. Now let's get back to Broadmead Commune. The top-down view shows us all the interesting spots we need to visit and how they are built. I'm going to start with corner towers. Now you might ask why defensive towers at all in a peaceful playthrough? And I could add my own why walls even. But the lack of attackers doesn't mean those elements don't add to the settlement's looks. It's a medieval settlement castle after all. And more importantly, structurally, these towers help settlers climb up the top walkways, which are additionally supported by tall wooden pillars, some of which look like they grow out of small buildings at the bottom. The other end features a simpler tower, whose design is copied on the other side. The space they take up might be said to be a waste, but again, as I proposed a moment ago, they are a staple of these kinds of settlements, so they do have a place here. As for the construction aspect of those, I find the mix of materials and choices of each type to be different, a very good decision to prevent the whole settlement from looking simplistic or copy-pasted. 
For it to be symmetrical, like this one is, is one thing. To be all the same everywhere you look would not be good or interesting. There is an important lesson in that. Now in the other corner we find a tree grove of sorts with a zen garden for playing Bakugamon games. The reason I have trees off right now is this. If they are on, you can't see anything from above. This garden also offers a direct path to the kitchens, so more red currants can be stockpiled once harvested. There is a whole line of them next to the walls, leading to another identical garden slash park, another example of symmetry in the settlement's design. As for the main buildings, this one contains something that looks like an official discussion room, town hall sort of affair, and I love the detail of having chairs at the cartography table. I must admit this never even occurred to me, but it looks amazing. The gold at the back has an almost comedy look because of the forbidding hand. Sure, it's there so settlers don't redistribute it and ruin the room's design, but you can't not think of it like a keep your TV hands off sign. <laughs> Below is another stately room, highly decorated, even featuring some of the higher quality armor, with gold being used not for quality, but for the superior looks. If the tables in Going Medieval could be circular, I think this room would be the place where Knights of the Round Table met up. I must admit, it's a bit odd I haven't run into a proper great hall room type by now, and I guess that one must be used as such. The other smaller buildings on the side look to be workshops. The first one is a sewing workshop and the one across from it is a brickmaker's workshop. But what I find strange is that there are no materials or finished products on stockpiles or shelves anywhere close to hand. That really hurts the efficiency of production in my book. Next door we have a blacksmith hard at work at his station crafting weapons and across from him an armorsmith station. But as I said, without resources at hand, this placement setup doesn't really give good results. Across the little crop fields we have the same setups, just different workbenches. These are the ones for brewing stimulants and alcohol production, while next door wood weapon production is located with a boyers and a woodworking station. Now what else is of interest at this ground level? Oh right, the small beautiful gardens with game tables complete with braziers to keep warm when playing outside in cold weather. The clay brick paths lead directly to the other side where a mirror image of this garden exists. There are a few more buildings on this level to check out, first of which are these two mini temples slash churches which provide easy access to religious activities so settlers don't spend too much time going down to the crypts or outside to the chapels. The big building is for tech research and as a library it has been left looking quite simplistic, just a big two-story box. Top level holding the accumulated knowledge of the commune and the lower level being filled with research workbenches of all levels plus a few bookshelves to get that library special room bonus. It is right above the settlers beds in fact, if only knowledge could drip into the mind as it sleeps. With all this looked over we can finally move up where there is a huge two level high sky bridge connecting the two top walkways going the length of the castle. That sky bridge is supported by just a few pillars in the middle which is quite the risk but it does look amazing especially with all the windows which I would have personally left open. Surprisingly the top level is another religious room but oddly it's a mixed one. It's not a temple or a church, so no negative mood modifier for any settler moving through it. The lower section is a simple path, but with a hole in the middle. Oh, that looks like a nasty fall, so it's blocked off by different objects. And since settler AI is smart enough not to run over holes, it's more of a role-playing fix. The one part of the settlement I haven't given enough credit is the curtain wall. It's not only two levels high, but the second level is also pulled back a step to let clay block metal ones be set on the top of the outer first level wall section. It's not something I have often seen in player settlement designs and I very much commend the idea. Before I show you some other settlements, I just want to say that I really love the many original aspects of Broadmead Commune and it has given me more than a few ideas to think over and use in my own future settlements and castle designs. The huge sky bridge, sunken crop farms with raised bushes, deep level crypts and dungeons and even the many gardens and parks. 
The inclusion of trees inside walls is another such great element. Now let's look at those other castles and settlements I mentioned. There is this huge square clay brick castle with massive low towers by Aazi with a gorgeous fog screenshot to boot. Aashaira has managed to create a shape which reminds me of architecture hundreds of years into the future from the medieval age. Don't Call Me Surly on the other hand made medieval castles which look straight out of the history books or at least movies and TV shows. The shot in winter is particularly awesome. The player going by Fighting Cookie built a settlement which looks like Asian architecture. I am just not sure does it look more Japanese or Chinese though, perhaps depending on the time frame. Javier created this fantastic settlement and main castle where night shots really bring out that old fashioned look especially with the clay block wall and tower edges. Might be a square castle with a courtyard but it's really well done. Kotuo did something similar with some notable design differences which are harder to see in the fog at night but no less beautiful. Jack Lowy, the player whose nickname I probably mispronounced, went for a fog shot also with his clay block and wood settlement but luckily also showed us some other screenshots. Those revealed the full size and shape of this settlement as well as some of the details. This one I would also like to take a tour of. Soyo is the builder of that massive settlement from episode 8 has another settlement he hasn't shared yet and I formally request an invite to this magnificent place. This arena alone is a reason enough. Last but not least, Sir Hundeman's settlement, the one dug into the mountain, like where dwarves live in The Hobbit and Lord of the Rings, is one of my next stops for a full video showcase. Until then my fellow gamers, happy gaming and thank you for watching.